Let no one caught in sin remain inside the lie of inward shame, but fix our eyes up on the cross and run to him who showed great love and bled for us freely you bled. Christ is risen from trouble, death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. It's great to have you here worshiping with us today. Uh, will you stand with me? I'm reading uh, from Psalm 18 as we begin our worship today. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Let's pray. God, we just thank you that you are our strength, you are our protection, you are our guide through this life, and we come to you today, we come together as a group, and we come to praise your name, to lift up the name of the Lord high in this world, to shine the light of Jesus through our lives and through our um, through the words that we sing and the music that we sing and through the fellowship that we have that you are honored today because of our presence here. And God, we just thank you for each person that is a part of our gathering tonight. We pray that um, they will feel a sense of your Holy Spirit in a profound way in their lives tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to, um, I need Mary and Emmanuel to come on and join us, and we're going to sing and worship God together tonight. Starting with the song, Oh Sing Praise. A couple ones tonight that we haven't done for a while, so it's great.
Because those are kind of two in me. What about that? What are these for? For him? We can sit on them. Let's sit on them. a few things going on in our church. It's great to see everybody here, and it's so hard to believe that summer is just about done and that kids are going back to school this week. I have to tell you that uh, uh, today or this weekend, I was thinking about Matthew, and I was thinking about, you know, how he's really worked so hard this summer helping with day camp, and we had a busy summer with family, and I just thought, oh, okay, he's got um, three more days that he can just kind of 
you know, rest and relax and we could maybe do something fun. I thought on Wednesday, I thought we'll do something fun as a family. And I had these kind of great plans that Matthew's going to have just the last three days of summer being just fantastic. And then I thought, I just better check the school schedule. And lo and behold, he starts school on Tuesday. Poor kid. <laughs> so he lost two full days of summer, just like that. And uh, anyways, so and it's a good thing I checked because he would have been going to school on Thursday saying, what, it's not the first day? <laughs> so anyway, so um, lots of stuff going to happen in the next little bit in our fall. And we are so excited about getting started up again. Um, uh, but we just also want to celebrate a fantastic summer. We had just so many kids part of our day camps. We had a, a staff that was just really fantastic. They were, they were young, and so I was a little bit worried about that at the beginning, but they just rose to every challenge and every situation, and they were fantastic. And so I, um, you know, we're just so blessed to have leadership in our church of our young people that are, are, is so good and they're so capable. And uh, so make sure that you thank uh, some of the day camp staff that are here tonight. Um, the other big highlight for me was seeing our young leaders uh, develop out of that. So our junior high leaders getting the chance to be the leaders for the first time. And it was wonderful to see how they, um, they also just worked so hard and uh, were there and showed up and they were helpful and great all summer long. And it's such a, a, a great summer of not just of ministering to the kids in the community but of developing the leaders and the kids in our own church and uh, what a blessing that we're able to do that with this government grant that we get and um, you know to to partially pay for that and so it's such a good thing so um, we are going to start uh, in the fall with a ministry fair we've kind of called it and it's going to be um, the, sort of the conclusion of our weekend. We're doing a weekend of prayer focus, so not this coming, not the long weekend, but the following weekend. And we want you to try and keep that weekend as free as possible. So on the Friday night, we're going to do our, um, our 7 to 11, our four hours of focused consecutive prayer, and um, which is, you know, just a great time. And then we'll have a prayer walk the next day where um, we gather and just walk in the community and pray. And then in the evening um, uh, at church on the Sunday, we're going to have an opportunity for, we're going to eat together first before church, and then we're going to have an opportunity for you to just see all of the different places that you can plug into ministry, places that you can serve. Uh, for, for this whole time of COVID, we've kind of, you know, fallen away from the things that we typically do and we kind of have a skeleton crew you know keeping everything going and we need to just get back this fall to everyone just being part of the serving and using our gifts to serve God and so we have just a place where everyone can plug in um, or even if it's just attending a Bible study or attending kids programs or um, or if it's helping out whatever it is and so um, that's going to happen in two weeks from now and so we want you to be ready for that and just already be um, praying about it and asking God to just show you where he needs to grow you this year where do you need to grow in your in your faith and in your practice and your walk with God this year so we want you to be a part of that and um, uh, I think that is all that we need to say right now but just I guess the women's breakfast I wanted to keep that um, on uh, the focus that's the last Saturday of September so women keep that that Saturday morning um, ready and um, I guess in the uh, email that went around today there was an invitation for all the men and uh, uh, kind of youth boys to um, play soccer and that is a couple Sundays from now too so and that's um, in a Sunday sort of at one o'clock I think and uh, so just kind of a fun game of soccer and it can be as fun or as serious as you want to make it so Anyway, uh, we'll give you details about that, but men and young men, keep that also ready to, so that you can participate and just build relationships once again, connect with people in, um, in a way that, that we need to. Um, we also, 
uh, we don't talk about money very much in our church. We don't talk, you know, we don't, you know, make big appeals. But we do want to let you know that uh, as we get into fall, too, we want to make sure that we are being able to meet all of our uh, all of our commitments, especially to the missions that we support and to, um, you know, the ministries that we do. And so, uh, you know, as you're sort of planning for the fall, just remember to keep the, uh, you know, what you give as, uh, as part of your, you know, your household budget and your finances, that that giving piece is the first part of what you do. So we want to encourage you in that. And if you have questions ever about giving and, you know, how to give, uh, we will just ask us and we will let you know. But anyways, we're going to sing one more song right now. Um, the Lord is my salvation. And so please sing with us. Actually, why don't you stand? I'm not good at sitting on stools anyway. So. church we are celebrating uh it's charles birthday today and are you 13 
12? 12. Anyways, and so his parents have brought some pizza for everybody, so make sure you stick around after church. Kids, I'm going to send you off to Sunday school with your leaders, and uh, they will meet you out there. And while we're saying happy birthday, there are some other people that are celebrating birthdays as well. Am I allowed to say it, Melanie? Is it? So. <laughs> It's also Melanie's birthday, so so make sure you say happy birthday to her as well. <laughs> All right. Well, back in the in the days of COVID, when we were locked down, Jeff and I used to preach together like this. I don't know if you remember that we would sit in our little armchairs and. You know, all three of you that were tuning in, you uh, you saw us, and um, and we were missing those days a little bit, and so Jeff pulled in these stools, and I really can't stand sitting on stools, so this is going to actually distract me terribly. But anyway, um, so we thought that today we would, uh, I don't know, do that again just for fun, and. Um, uh, so bear with us. Uh, this week was the, the finale of our summer ministries, and we had our junior high youth camp. And it was, it was just so much fun. So it was, we had 18 youth, 18 junior highs that were uh, part of the whole week. And um, some of them were from our church, some of them were not. And so it was a really great mix of kids. A lot of them were younger, and so they were like brand new to junior high. But basically everybody was new to, new to youth because of COVID, we haven't had anything normal. There hasn't been anything normal for the whole time that they've been they've been in youth and so um so it was really really a fun week and they had they had tons of fun together and um it ended with a, a camp an overnight camp and we went to blue brana camp which is down by chain lakes and we spent the night there and there were 14 kids that were able to um to come to that and it was it was just such a fun way to end the summer it was fun for the leaders and it was just fun for the kids and i joined them for that and and actually it was the f the first time i'd really joined for any length of time throughout the whole summer and so it was just really uh, great to be a part of that and to see what god was doing in the lives of our kids one of the things that happened this week um, that, well, you know, it's just one of these things that happens. So we had, on Tuesday, we had planned to, um, they, we had this great, amazing race um, planned for the morning, which with the best food challenge, for those of you who've been involved in the amazing race before, I just felt inspired when this food challenge came to my mind. I'm going to tell you what it was, because it was, it's so awful. And um, so they had to go and they had to buy a drink from McDonald's, you know, for from dollar drink days. And then they were given a list of fast food items to buy at other restaurants. And they had to choose what they wanted to buy. And then they had to later on, like maybe a half an hour later, they got to the location so they had to carry it with them. And then they got to the Atabayo house. And in the Atabayo house, they, um, Mary, smoothied what they got for them. So she put their drink and their fast food item into a blender and the team had to drink the gray sludge that, <laughs> that came out of it. And I, oh, it just made, it just thrilled me. <laughs> Anyways, it was just, it just gave me so much joy. I can't Gives even Gives you a little you. insight <laughs> into. <laughs> it's yeah. terrible. It was terrible, the worst, but I just felt inspired when that came to mind. Anyways, so that day, they were going to end the day at the lake in Sundance, and they were going to have a beach day, and it was going to be lots of fun. But that day, if you remember, on Tuesday, it just rained, and it was just really an awful, awful day. And so they had to change the plan at the last minute quickly. And so they, so we decided to go to this movie that was at the Cheap Theater, and it was rated PG. It had some, you know, familiar actors. People sort of knew about it, but not, you know, we didn't know that much about this movie, but we were hoping the PG rating would be good. So we're at the, the kids are at the movie, the leaders are there, and then I get maybe about 20 minutes into the movie, Maggie texts me and says, I'm just not so sure about this movie. I'm not sure it's the very best movie to be in. And I said, okay, well, just, you know, if you feel like it's not, you can leave at any moment. You can just get up and leave. 
And, and so anyway, so they waited a little longer. And then after a bit, I got a text from Maggie saying, we just got up and we just all left. And, and I, my first thought is, oh my goodness, we've taken the kids to an awful movie and now the parents are gonna say, what did you do? And how have you taken our kids to this awful movie? And then um, I thought about it uh, as you know, I, the afternoon went on and I thought, you know what, actually we've taught the kids something really, really good. We've taught them that you can find yourself in situations that you didn't expect, something that you didn't expect, and it's totally okay to walk away from the situation that you are in, even if you've invested money in the situation, even if you've invested time in the situation. If it is not good, it's not, you can walk away, it's good. And as Christians, there are times in our lives where we find ourselves in situations and it's okay to walk away. So that's kind of what we're talking about tonight. Yeah, so sort of the idea is, is how do we honor God in situations that aren't very God-honoring, right? So when we find ourselves in a situation that, that is challenging, trying, that, that it runs counter to what we know God would want, what do we do? Because we're there. And, and we want to sort of look at it from two different angles. And, and one is, is when we get swept up, and one is when we get caught up. Right? And, and, and the way I want to look at that it, differently is that sometimes we just find ourselves in the middle of a situation that we say, this, this is not where I need to be. This is not honoring. And, and, but we're there because that's sort of the way that the world is. That's the way that life is. We, we, live, we live in a world that doesn't always follow you know, what God wants. And, and sometimes just being part of that right? Because we can't just go hunker in a bunker, right? We can't hide out from society and culture and the world. And so sometimes just by living in this world, we find ourselves in situations that, that really push against our Christian faith. And then other times we get caught up. And by that, I mean sometimes we find ourselves looking over the fence saying, that looks like a really good time. <laughs> that looks really interesting. And I know that maybe God isn't 100% for it, but maybe it's okay if I just kind of do it a little, or I kind of involved in it a little, and, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves, you know, just, just doing it. Even though we know this isn't something God wants, and this isn't something where I'm going to be able to, you know, um, live my faith out, but I'm here. Okay, and so I don't know, like maybe Julie and I are the only two people here that have found ourselves in either of those situations, but we have, and I would think that, that you all have been there as well. So that's what we want to look at. So, but we're going to look at a couple of Bible passages that speak to those caught up and swept up. So when I went out to the junior high camp on Thursday night, this was the, the passage that I kind of spoke from. It was Daniel chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles or on your phones, you can uh, look at it. It's a familiar passage, a familiar story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And this is an example of people who are swept up by the culture. It's not their fault that they're in this situation. They are caught in this difficult situation, and they have done nothing to place themselves there. It's not, you know, it's not anything that, um, that they did. It's not, the, it wasn't their choice. And sometimes that's the way it is for us as Christians, that, you know, we're just going along, we're just living our lives, and all of a sudden we realize that we're in the middle of something that we shouldn't be, and we didn't plan to be there. And I know like with our, with our junior highs, a lot of them, you know, at going to junior high for the first time, this happens to kids in school, and it happens so quickly that all of a sudden they thought that they were just going to the mall and shopping, but then they're with somebody that's, you know, shoplifting, and boom, you're you know, you find yourself in a totally different situation than you thought you were in. But I think this happens to us as adults too, that we are, you know, we're at work or, you know, we're, we're, we're with friends and we're caught up in a conversation that we didn't ever plan to be in, or we're caught up, you know, just kind of in negativity or in, in, in just speech that's just not okay. Even the jokes and, and mm -hmm. all of that, mm -hmm. you know, you can wind up getting sidetracked. And, 
and, and just even negativity, like how just being negative and complaining, um, just all of that can be so destructive to us. And then all of a sudden we're just caught up in that and we realize, oh my goodness, how did I get here? How did I get, you know, so negative about this situation so so quickly and um anyways and we're just we're just swept up swept up without us even knowing so um i'm gonna actually read the whole section from daniel's chapter three just in case you've forgotten the story of shadrach meshach and abednego so it takes place um in the old testament so this is before jesus and like hundreds of years when the um, Israelites have been taken into captivity by the Babylonians. In this translation, they're called the Chaldeans. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews, the Israelites. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought so they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace." Then these men were bound in their cloaks and their tunics, their hats and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. We'll just stop there for now. So in this, in this passage, in this story, it's this beautiful story of three people being swept into a culture, into a religion, into a, a system and they had, no, they had no way out. They were prisoners, basically, when they were taken into Babylon, and they were identified as people, as young men who would be good leaders, and they were, um, they were to be assimilated into the Babylonian culture. That was the plan, that they would be educated and then assimilated into the culture. 
but here we have these three men that are saying, you know, even though we've been swept along, this has happened to us. We didn't plan any of this. This wasn't our intention. We're going to resist. But I think it's interesting to see that when King Nebuchadnezzar brings Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to him, he is fully expecting that he's going to put it before them. He's thinking maybe they didn't understand the whole bow down and worship this God and go into the fiery furnace. Maybe they didn't think that he would, they didn't think I was serious, he's thinking. So he brings them and he says, I'll just tell them. I'll tell them how serious I am about this, that I, that I mean it, that I mean it, that you will go into the fiery furnace if you don't bow down. Bow down. He thought that it was a no-brainer that they're just going to bow down because it wasn't even that Nebuchadnezzar was saying, deny your own God. He's saying, just add another God in because the Babylonians, they worshiped whatever God came their way. Very much like our world now, where whatever sort of belief system comes along, we're just sort of expected to adopt it in some ways or to recognize it and to value it. And that's what they were doing. They were going along. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were living in this pluralistic society, and they weren't calling people out for their beliefs. They weren't being, they were just um, doing what Jeremiah the prophet had said to them to do to, they were working for the good of the city that they found themselves in. And so they were there just doing what they felt was right, but they weren't worshiping the gods. They were only worshiping their one God, and it hadn't been noticed until this moment. And so King Nebuchadnezzar is saying to them, no, bow down and add this statue into all of the other gods, because he's assuming that they're pluralists, that they, you know, have lots of beliefs just like him. But we know that as followers of God, we believe in the one true God. We can't bring in um, elements of all different religions and belief systems into our faith. We serve God. We serve God through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And so as our, our world surrounds us and tells us that, you know, it's okay to just, you know, to sort of believe everything and make everybody feel okay, sure, fine. But when it comes down to it, we as Christians only bow down to one God. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shocked King Nebuchadnezzar when they said, no, we will not. We will not do that at the expense possibly of our own lives. But we believe we believe that our God has the ability to save us. We don't know if he will, but we believe and have faith that he can. And that enraged the people around him. I think sometimes that can be how it is in our world too. When we stand up and we stand firm for Jesus Christ, it makes people angry because they're like, no, how can you say that you know the only way? How can you say that your religion is the only way? I don't know. Have you heard that people said that to you before? How can you say that it's the only way? And that, that shock turns to rage, just like in, in this story oftentimes, <laughs> right? People get mad, right? And, yeah. Absolutely. And as Christians, our job is to stand firm and not to judge. They didn't stand there and say, you know what? you should be the one going into the furnace because of your belief in bowing down to this God. They didn't do any of that. They didn't call out the, the beliefs of the Babylonians and say, you're wrong, you will end up in the fiery furnace. None of that stuff. They said, for us, for us, we will follow what we know to be true. And they knew that their witness would speak volumes. And that's exactly what did happen. Um, if we just finish the last little bit of the passage. Oh, but I lost where I stopped. Um, where was I? 28. Okay, thank you. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, so he's pulled them out. There's no smell of smoke on them. Nebuchadnezzar which, which if you've been at a campfire this summer, you know is 
quite a miracle. <laughs> yes, as, as we were talking about this with the junior highs, we were all like completely smelling of smoke at that moment. And so I said, so, you know, we're, and we're not even in the fire, we're just next to it. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So here, their stance, not their judgment, not their anything, their stance to say, we follow only God only God, and their firm stance against everything else changed the king's heart. And it wasn't, it wasn't anything about them pointing fingers. It was them standing firm. And as Christians, as the church, I want to encourage you when we are swept up in a culture, because we're all swept up in a culture that wants us to deny our faith at times, wants us just to minimize our faith even, that we stand firm and we only bow to God. And that witness, even though that's hard, and it might mean a fiery furnace at some point, even though it's hard, that witness is the thing that changes people's hearts and changes the world. Anyways. I, I know for me, this story always reminds me of uh, a, book, a book I first read when, when I became a Christian, right? So in my 20s. And there was this line in it where it said, you know, sometimes God parts the Red Sea, and sometimes God stands in the furnace with us. But, but just that knowledge that no matter what we go through, when we stand up and we have faith that says that, that you know, I believe that, that the God that I serve can deliver me, and even if he doesn't, I will still do what's right, that, that God will join us in that challenge. And, and I just encourage you with that. In those times where you feel like you're fighting against this, this just this wave that's overcoming you, in terms of, of you know just being being uh, caught up that way. Um, but again, we said that sometimes that's the case, but other times it's it's different. And if we look in First uh, Corinthians chapter ten, right? First Corinthians chapter ten, um, it it speaks to a similar challenge, but but in a different perspective. And so I just want to read that as well. So if you turn to that, that's in the New Testament, right? And, and the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, I have... Second, verse oh, 21, right? Uh, sorry, verse 20, 23. Yeah, 23. So chapter 10, verse 23. It says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience for. Uh, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And if an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of, of conscience. I am referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? Well, if I take part in the meal with, the th with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. And then in 11... Chapter 11, verse 1, it says this. It says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And I think that speaks to another time where, where the world around us puts a lot of influence on us, but instead of it sort of overwhelming us and forcing us in, sometimes we want to join, right? Sometimes we say, you know what? God's already, already paid my sin debt, right? Anything that I do is covered by his grace. So why don't I just jump in and enjoy life? Right? And, and this isn't just the people of Corinth. This was also, you know, Paul writes something similar in, um, in the sixth chapter of Romans where, right, where he, he talks about the fact that shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? And he says, God forbid, right? He says, no. 
And, and so I think that sometimes we can get caught up in that, right? We can see what's going on and we're like, well, what harm is it, right? To crack a little joke, to, you know, maybe cut a few corners, to, you know, fudge some numbers on my taxes or my expense, right? To, you know, say something about my neighbor that is maybe a little bit true, but maybe not entirely true, right? Whatever it is, right? Where we say, it, it's just, it's harmless. It's harmless. It's just, it's not a big deal. And I think that the Apostle Paul comes and says, listen, people of Corinth slash people of Newgate, right? Hear me say this, that, that the Christian life is not a life that is spent trying to chase after getting away with anything that you can get away with, right? It's, 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 we, don't, we don't chase a God of the loopholes, right? That, that we want to make sure that, that when we are living our lives to their fullest Christian potential, it is not for our own good, but it's for the good of others, right? And sometimes we miss that, right? And, and I, I'll say one thing first here, though. Uh, when we did this on video um, and we were sitting in our chairs, we were able to kick each other, yeah. you know, just off of camera. So, so anyways, so I saw a twitch. Well, okay. Well, so um, one of the things, I was just reading last week uh, a study or something. I don't even, can't even remember where I was reading it, but it was um, looking at Christian young adults. And um, this is the uh, the idea that as Christians we have our public beliefs and so we would all come together and say yes I believe this and I believe this and I you know I believe that we need to live for Jesus and I believe that we need to you know not do these things and yet our private beliefs are very differently and we think well that's what we all say we believe but we don't actually follow that and the thing is we actually are supposed to this is and we've we've just kind of gotten a little bit mixed up anyway so this in this study um the the one point was they they asked you know a certain amount of of uh young adults in their 20s uh, half of them were raised in the church and called themselves Christians. Half of them were not. They were all unmarried people in their 20s. And they said, they asked if sex outside of marriage was um, okay. And the church young adults almost across the board said no. It is not okay. The non-church young adults, uh, about, uh, uh, about three quarters of them said, you know, that it's totally 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 fine and then they asked in private you know what they asked them if they have you know engaged in sex outside of marriage and there was almost no difference between the young adults who were raised in the church and the young adults who weren't I'm not telling you this young adults so that you say see it's all okay no that's <laughs> not the thing the thing is that we as Christians need to say our public beliefs, what we state publicly, what we believe to be true and right is also how we live in private. Because otherwise we're like these Corinthians where we're getting swept up in, or we're getting, like we're choosing, we're not getting swept up, we're choosing to live differently than we're supposed to live. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you yeah. break your train no, of thought. No, no that's okay. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think that that's, that's the thing, right, is, is that we have to look at you know, what is it that, that we're, we're allowed to do and how are we allowed to do it? Because otherwise, otherwise we, we live our lives kind of like trust fund kids with our parents' credit cards, right? Where we can just rack it up and we can do whatever we want because we know that it's going to be paid for. And sometimes we treat God like that, that, that what Jesus did on the cross is just something that's just going to take care of every little thing that, that I want. And, and we don't see the cost that that was. We need to make sure that we understand that there was a tremendous cost for our forgiveness, right, and live accordingly. Right? Now, the other part of this passage that's interesting is that it says, but, you know, as far as like food offered in sacrifice, and says, you know, if someone offers you food, then eat it. Remember that, that, that Paul is, is writing to a group of people that, that it's a mix. There, there are some, some Jewish Christians, there are some non-Jewish Christians, some Gentiles, right? And, and everybody came at it from a different angle, but everybody would know that in the sort of the, um, the history or the heritage of Christianity is Judaism, which had all those Old Testament food laws, right? And, and, and Paul is sort of saying, look it, understand what, what the main things are. 
right? Understand what, what the most important things are and live according to that. And, and we see this, right? Because there's the, in Acts chapter 9, there's the story with uh, Cornelius, with, with the Roman, and where, you know, where we see sort of God lifting the, the food laws. And so we can have bacon. That's a little in-house discussion, though. We, we, so. we don't eat bacon in our house. <laughs> but, but just this idea that, you know, that, that, um, that the food lies. He says, everything in the, in, the, in the world is the Lord's, right? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And so he says, it's all covered, right? But, but, then he gives a little caveat. He says, but if someone tells you that it's been offered in sacrifice, then don't eat it. And you might say to yourself, wait a second, and this is where, right, this is where um, oftentimes people say, well, look at the hypocrisy of it. Look at the, you know, like, uh, you Christians, right? You're allowed to do this and not allowed to do that, and, you know, it depends on who's looking. And, and Paul, I think, explains it really well. He's not saying that, that our, our lives are to be directed as a show, right? We don't pretend to, to not eat the food offered to the idols because we, we don't want people to get the wrong idea. We, we don't eat the food offered to the idols because we don't want to mess with people's own conscience, right? And again, you know, this is mentioned earlier in Corinthians about, you know, meat that's offered to idols. And it says, don't be a stumbling block to other believers, right? And I think that that so much is, is what I pull out of this passage more so than, you know, whether we are or aren't allowed to eat bacon, whether we are or aren't allowed to eat meat that's been offered to idols, are or aren't allowed, and he says, you know, when you eat, drink, or do anything, right, so there's lots of stuff, right, he recognizes that, the, you know, the internet hasn't been invented yet, he's saying, you know, there's lots of stuff that's going to come out there, and in all of it, he gives us this understanding that we must live our lives in a way that is not just about what can I get away with, but what's good for others, right? That, that it's not about myself, it's about others. And living a life that, that lifts people up and ultimately that glorifies God, right? And, and I think that's really, really important, is that we do these things to the glory of God, and we do it so that others don't stumble as they try and pursue the glory of God as well. Right? And, and then he says at the end of it, right, follow me as I follow Christ. That's got to be something that, that resonates with us. We're not perfect, and we will make mistakes, and we will do things that maybe make people stumble, but that should not be our intent, and, and we need to make sure that we're saying, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me in, the, in, the, in doing the best that I can as other people watch me. Not as a show, but but as an example. Uh, and I think, that, I think that Paul makes that very clear. So, yes, we struggle with being swept up and caught up, but if we keep our eyes, right, on, on the glory of God, I think that we'll keep, we'll keep growing. The, um, a while ago, I was in the conversation, just to conclude, I was in a conversation with someone who was just sort of feeling like that things were just a mess all the time. And they said to me, um, God must be really mad at me, and this is why I'm going through this situation. God must just be so mad at me. And I said, that's not how God operates. He doesn't operate that way. And I said, God is, God is love, and he loves us all the time, and he's not vindictive, and he's not like that. And, um, and you know, he just insisted that, you know, it must, it must be, you know, what he has done. And I said, well, maybe you need to repent maybe. And, um, and that got, you know, the person thinking a little bit. And, but very quickly, the conversation came back to justifying himself. And he, and he said to me, well, this is why I did what I did, and blah, 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 and gave me all of the reasons that he had, you know, done the things that just a little bit ago, he was saying that God must be so mad at him for. And I thought, you know what, we're so much like this that we get swept up, we get caught up, whatever it is, and instead of just coming back to Christ, and instead of saying, God, you know what, this happened. I know you don't hold it against me, but I just feel like I need your help to turn it around. I need to acknowledge it. Repentance is for us. God doesn't change. He doesn't need our repentance. 
we sometimes need to come to God with repentance, and we need to say, you know what, this is the situation, this is where I'm at. But instead, we choose justification. We choose to justify ourselves, not God's amazing justification. We justify ourselves before God, and we say, see, I'm not so bad. I'm pretty good. There was a reason I needed to get so angry in that situation. There was a reason I needed to do this. There was a reason I needed to treat that person like that or do this at work or whatever it is. And God says, no, you've missed it. You've missed it. Don't save yourself. Don't justify yourself. Let me justify you. Let me save you. And so today, whatever it is that you tend to get caught up in or tend to get swept up in, whatever it is that you are swept up in or caught up in, give it to God. Just give it to him. Acknowledge it before God and give it to him and get back on track so that we start this fall with everybody moving in the same direction saying, I want to live my life bringing glory and honor to God in every situation. But anyways, why don't you pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you meet us right where we are, that you don't expect us to be perfect people, that you don't expect us to have everything all together, but, but you do expect us to have a heart that desires you. And so, God, well, that's what we pray for. We pray, God, that our greatest desire would be to, to glorify you, and that in doing so, we would also look out for the good of the many, that, that Lord, that, that we would be pursuing a, a life that, that just you know, makes, makes you number one and allows us to just get it back on track. And so for all those times where we've been caught up or swept up, God, we just pray for forgiveness. We pray for courage and strength. We pray for God, the, the, your direction. Uh, and, and then, God, we just we receive your grace and your mercy and we move forward. And, God, we pray for us as individuals, but we also pray for that as a church. And, God, we pray it all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. I'm going to ask our music team to come on back. We're going to close with a song that we haven't sung for a really long time, Draw Me Close to You. And uh, just let's make this our prayer as we go, that we are, that God just draws us in and draws us close to him, and he's always with us. So let's stand as we sing. And then actually, with that pizza, we're going to need people to serve it, okay? Like if, if we can do that so it's not just little hands all over. Laying that out there. <laughs> Thanks.
Or let's go out with a doxology with a good word. It comes from the letter of Jude, and I think it's fitting for what we talked about. It says this, To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Just a reminder, if the leadership team, if we can connect before you guys take off tonight, that would be great. So just a quick, quick meeting.